Hello all, and uh, thank you for coming to this session of the Mental Wellness Summit. Uh, my name's Cameron, and I'm just here to introduce your next presenter, uh, Ben McCauley. Um, and Ben McCauley is the manager of Foundry Kelowna. Uh, ben also has a history as a, of a uh, youth mental health counselor. And we're gonna hear from Ben around the evolution of youth mental health services. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, chatting with you today. Uh, just firstly wanted to acknowledge that uh, I'm calling from Kelowna, BC, um, and to acknowledge that I'm on the unceded and traditional uh, territory of the Sealed Okanagan people. Um, <clears throat> I, I was uh, happy to kind of undertake this project when Cameron reached out and uh, talk a little bit about uh, my experience in working with youth um, in mental health and uh, substance use area. Um, sorry about that. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, getting a chance to kind of um, share my screen here for a second, but um, to talk about youth mental health care. And as I talk about this, uh, I'm going to uh, mostly be referring to uh, a little bit of the genesis of, of Foundry in the province of BC, but, but mainly with a focus on my experience in uh, Kelowna. I've been here for the last three years uh, as the manager and uh, prior to that working as a family uh, a family counselor and a child and youth family counselor uh, in the industry for the last uh, uh, number of years, and as well as um, with school districts and um, and private practice. But um, now um, I'm going to get this uh, these slides. But I'm excited to show uh, new graphics that uh, are actually designed by uh, young people uh, from our our province and. Um, I encourage you please to ask any questions. Um, I'm going to keep the chat open in the corner here. If anything comes through, uh, happy to uh, to stop at any point and go over go over anything um, that might need some uh, some more detail or questions um, answered. Um, so just uh, yeah, please fire away. Um, so looking at. A uh, quick outline of what I hope to cover today. Um, a bit of a brief history, uh, our five core services, um, some stats and demographics over 2021, uh, and a little bit more broad than that. Um, how we came about uh, engaging our youth and community partners in a project like Foundry. Uh, and then some challenges and opportunities that we have moving forward, and, and in particular, what we have learned through our engagement with young people and, uh, and community partners and, uh, and First Nations um, allies here in Kelowna in particular. Um, so this is, we're coming up on our five year anniversary for our center here in, in Kelowna. And we we're among the first phase of Foundry Center. So I think we we're one of the first three open. And, and now there are uh, between 11 and 18 in various stages of, um, of operation. I think there are 11 open and operating uh, with more coming online this year um, and, and 18 in the works and, and more planned for after that. Um, it, it is a, a big undertaking to start a project like this as, as many of you can likely imagine. Um, you know, having funding in place and uh, rallying communities and individual spots uh, is uh, a huge job. And so in Kelowna in particular, we're looking at a number of uh, local partnerships and, and each Foundry Center is um, operated by different lead organization. So I work with the Canadian Mental Health Association Kelowna branch, and um, we are the lead operator for Foundry in Kelowna. And uh, our partners vary from community to community as well. Um, we have kind of a, a, a series of, of partners kind of classified in different categories. 
um, but our focus really was with um, super partners, we'd call them, um, as those who are committing um, resources, whether it's uh, funding, um, in-kind service, or otherwise to really get Foundry off the ground. Uh, some of those are the school district, um, the local school district 23 here in central Okanagan, the Interior Health Authority, um, the Ministry of Child and Family Development, and um, a, a number of other partners who would be on board as well. So from individual psychiatrists or doctors, family doctors, to um, nonprofit organizations such as uh, uh, Brain Trust or Boys and Girls Club of Okanagan um, and uh, our programs and, and various uh, other partners as well. Uh, our focus was to be a disruptor really. When we look at the challenges that youth have had accessing, accessing service, if you put yourself in the shoes of a young person um, who may be in crisis or on the verge of crisis and wondering where to start um, prior to Foundry, the access points were fairly limited. Uh, often that was family doctors, if, uh, if we had one. And, and as we know, family doctors in general uh, are tough to come by uh, for people who are not already connected and with the shortage of doc family doctors. Um, but you can go to the emergency room or you can go to the walk-in um, the walk-in access to child and youth mental health through the uh, Ministry of uh, Child and Family Development uh, through certain chunks of a uh, couple times a week you can go to the walk-in access so it was you know kind of government access um, often very clinical environment and and quite frankly not very welcoming to the young people of our community uh, with uh, many reporting um, you know, really challenging experiences that would actually dissuade them from, from accessing services in general. Not to say that there wasn't some excellent work done by partners, uh, but the, the system itself was often set up to dissuade um, access. So uh, Foundry was intent to be a disruptor and, and that word is key because we're gonna come back to that a little bit later in the presentation here, but um, so transforming access to removing those barriers uh, Foundry was often billed um, much to, to our own uh, struggle as a one-stop shop. Um, and we'll learn a little bit about our core services, but under one roof, we have a, a number of uh, different disciplines of service. So um, to be able to come to one spot and be told that this is the, the right place for you was our goal. And we don't, uh, we don't anymore proclaim to have all of the answers, but we can at least say this is the, a good place to start. Um, as you'll see going forward, our, our design was uh, meant to uh, sort of uh, reflect a place that would be warm and welcoming as opposed to clinical. While we offer clinical and therapeutic services, we, we didn't want to feel that way. We wanted to, uh, to be a place where you could see yourself hanging out where you could see yourself walking in and immediately uh, feel at ease with the surroundings. And so that took some time to put together and some uh, important engagement with our community partners. Uh, the, the target population is 12 to 24. Uh, in particular, that as we see particularly some of the stats, um, young people at that transition age where they're just about to not qualify for government support uh, as they turn 19, um, and really are kind of left in a gray area as you're supposed to be going on to uh, university or college or trade school. You're supposed to be moving out on your own. And um, you know that's not such a simple thing for, for many young people uh, who are not prepared to do so um, for a number of reasons. Um, as I mentioned, the foundry in Kelowna was forged with a number of partnerships as I uh, listed earlier. Um, and it's really important for us to note that Foundry itself is a collection of these agencies, which means they're on site providing service. So, um, you know, moving from uh, we support you, we have a, um, a letter of support for the launch of Foundry actually needed to turn into what are those partners contributing. Uh, and it's not always funding, um, but it is something that is client centered. And we're going to talk a little bit about more, uh, more about that as we go too. 
Uh, finally, it was designed by youth for youth. Um, initially, um, we, from the start, in every step of the way, included youth, uh, youth Action and Advisory Council, which was established before Foundry was, uh, to learn a bit about those issues I discussed um, of challenges and barriers to access. And so talking to the youth and understanding uh, what would they be interested in, what would they access uh, if they had kind of a dream scenario. Of course, um, you know, dreaming big is, is no problem. And then us actually putting uh, execution forward to make it happen as a, as a whole another story. But um, we feel that we had a great start uh, and, and I still have a long way to go, but um, I'm gonna take a look on this next slide at our center. So you can see the top photo is the, um, is the lobby. And you know, to, to me, it doesn't automatically uh, scream out, this is a, a healthcare facility. Uh, it's a, a little more full now than this picture with uh, artwork and, and posters and all sorts of advertisements for various uh, social or therapeutic groups. Uh, as well as two dogs, which uh, again is something we learned uh, from youth is very important uh, for the, the welcoming aspect. Uh, you'll see um, open workspace uh, in, in these desks. You might find uh, walk-in counselors, substance use counselors, occupational therapists, uh, psych nurses, uh, sharing space from different agencies. And the, the benefit of that is, um, you know, it's hard to actually quantify or put into um, any sort of measurables. But when you can have a conversation about a client uh, or a referral that's been made and it's someone who's sitting you know, five, 10 feet away from you, uh, rather than waiting weeks to hear formally or to make a warm handoff uh, when transferring service, uh, it's a huge benefit to, to our community, to our, our kids who desperately have uh, struggled with uh, accessing service at one point and getting lost on the way to the next stop. Um, so that is something that we, we care very deeply about, uh, about shifting. And um, we feel like we've made some impact, but we have, uh, again, some, some ways to go. In the bottom right, you can see uh, our teaching kitchen, which uh, has become a central hub for for youth to, uh, you know, it's the busiest place in our um, in our building when, when uh, you know, particularly during uh, pre-COVID times where we could fill the kitchen with food and games and um, typically young people will come in here, uh, have some snacks, make some food while they're waiting for a counseling appointment or seeing a doctor um, and they're able to connect with other young people as well as peer support. Moving on to our five core services. Um, and I will say that while we have these core services, most of our staff uh, and practitioners fall under these categories, but there are some that uh, kind of uh, work outside of these five core services. We have about 50, um, 55 people who work here on a regular basis, about 75 staff or practitioners who will rotate through here uh, on a week to week basis. Um, first of all is mental health and substance use services uh, that includes single session counseling and grief therapy and we, we do have a mandate to provide a same day walk-in service which uh, can be certainly a challenge um, and particularly with uh, with the pandemic having to move some services virtually and and still be able to meet the need of young people who uh, who did not take a break from uh, seeking mental health during the pandemic, which is, uh, which is good news for us that we're still able to provide that access, but also really telling of where we're at uh, as a society. Um, physical health, primary care. Uh, we have a number of uh, two GPs and uh, two nurse practitioners in the rotation providing uh, sexual health services, gender affirming care, withdrawal management. Uh, particularly in uh, gender affirming care, providing um, uh, hormone replacement therapy for young people, um, uh, for young uh, trans people. Um, uh, youth and family navigation are two distinct programs, even though they're under the same core service. Um, we have our direct service to youth 12 to 24, and then we support parents as well through family navigation uh, from zero to 25 be a caregiver uh, who would be seeking support, particularly for young people who are not able to engage 
uh, or not feeling like they're they're able to engage um, at this point. Youth peer support, uh, we have two peer support workers uh, with lived experience as well as a family peer support worker with lived experience who, uh, who contribute to our walk-in times to be available for young people and families. Uh, social services, housing, income assistance, employment support um, through specific programs that support all of those and partnerships with um, the Ministry of uh, Poverty Reduction and uh, uh, Work BC and partnerships like that. Um, one, and I mentioned this earlier, um, as the manager here in forging partnerships with, with new partners or um, renewing partnerships with, with partners from the beginning is we require that if you are going to contribute something here, you need to offer more than um, just a, a, an appointment next week. Uh, when someone comes in, they need to get a service that day, uh, at least to start to it. So if there's an intake process, we need that to happen here. We need to not make someone travel to another location and retell their story. Um, the goal is to just kind of keep it, keep it to, you know, this is the right place for you to be right now. And we're going to find a way to say yes and, uh, and provide that service. Quickly through our stats, uh, I'm really happy to share uh, this if, uh, with my email at the end. Um, happy to share any of these in more uh, more detail. We collect a lot of statistics um, through iPads or um, surveys that are sent to young people's um, electronic devices. This is just a quick snapshot of three months last uh, last year in our third quarter. Um, and you can see that we do not, uh, we're still pretty steady around 500 young people every three months, uh, unique uh, new youth registering. Uh, and then importantly, you see that, uh, you know, out of 910 unique youth, almost 3000 services access. That means people were getting more than one service per visit, which was, which is our goal. So they don't have to go multiple places. Uh, over a six month snapshot, we took some more demographic information. You can see that uh, number one concern is mental health, um, walking counseling and physical health uh, came behind that. And um, uh, yeah, there's some, uh, it goes down from there. Uh, looking at age, we can see um, not as many young uh, between 12 and 15, but as we hit those transition ages between 17 and 20, and then uh, university, post-university age group uh, between 21 and 24 is a spike as well. Particularly this section, we're a little closer to 30%, usually with male, but um, it's female dominated. Uh, as well as um, you know, a number of a high number of young people who are not identifying with any particular gender. And then culturally, um, indigenous community represents about 8% of our uh, youth in the communities, and we're at about 16% here and rising, particularly with some recent work with engagement with the West Bank First Nations uh, locally. We'll talk a little bit more on that in youth engagement coming up. And then of course, sexual orientation, um, more than half of our young people not identifying as, uh, as heterosexual. And um, we have a really great uptake. We can see our, our numbers are, are mean, is a, you know, a high number of young people who are actually uh, accessing these surveys and completing those, which, which helps us a lot. This is key here, um, our K-10 survey, which, uh, which we sent to all new clients, then again, uh, within three months uh, to kind of measure distress. Uh, you can see between high and very high distri distress, we're, we're over 90%. That means, you know, nine out of 10 of kids who are coming in here would, would rate themselves at high or very high distress, on, in particular on their first visit. And then young people who, in general, would rate their health um, at fair at 39%, which is significant. And then almost 50% of young people rating their mental health as poor. Uh, this is an important, uh, important page. I won't spend it too long on it, but just to understand that young people are particularly, you know, not through social media, not through... Uh, advertisements, it's through family members and their doctors who are recommending them uh, to a high number. Um, and then of course, teachers, school counselors playing a big role there as well. Um, you don't see 
uh, internet or online search until about three three point nine percent there. So uh, really important to include families in this process as they are the ones who are driving young people to access service uh, in a number of ways. So looking at um, youth and community engagement, we have um, a number of community partners. We initially made some mistakes, uh, and I will say you know, we didn't approach it always the right way looking at um, uh, our work with the First Nations community. And we had to go back to the drawing board and look at it as not a uh, chance to uh, you know, have a, a token Indigenous person um, to uh, contribute to our design process. And, and through some difficult conversations, we, we went back and did a lot of learning uh, and engaging those partners in a meaningful way. Um, you know, through that learning process of, you know, did we, yes, we, we, we had great intentions, but we didn't really listen and understand. You know, we listened to youth, but one area that we needed to really include, um, uh, or one group that was needed including was the elders of the community. And so going back to down at the bottom, you see our wellness on wheels mentioned, uh, we, we looked at who wasn't accessing and one of the, the uh, areas of the barriers to accessing services here was transportation. So uh, we raised funds in order to build a mobile clinic to access some of these communities, whether they're fringe areas of um, the regional area or the uh, First Nations communities to particularly go on the West Bank First Nations um, land and offer a service there in conjunction with the First Nations, um, with the First Nations elders and young people. Uh, we designed this unit uh, to, uh, as a, we uh, purchased it from the US from the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs as a mobile clinic and converted it to uh, be a bit more youth friendly and with counseling space as well as a medical room uh, for um, a public health nurse and um, telehealth with the GP if needed. Uh, that's something that's a pilot project that launched in September and uh, and so far, we've uh, seen a great uptake, particularly from our First Nations community, uh, from West Bank First Nation, where we've um, started to build some great relationships, uh, continue some great relationships, and uh, uh, offer some uh, some services that complement services that are already offered, and uh, not to replace anything, but to um, to get a better understanding of the needs that, that community has. So. Um, so some of the challenges that we've seen have been moving, as I mentioned, from disruptor to mainstream. So initially, it was great to get everyone on board to say, yeah, well, this the system's not working, it's broken, this is going to change it. A yes and no, because as we, you know, as you can see, we've seen over 5,000 young people in the last few years, and um, we've had great community support. As we get more community and financial support, we move from disruptor to mainstream. And the challenges of that is become we, we aren't enough. We, we haven't done enough. We haven't put enough resources into it. So, um, you know, initially we were open for, uh, you know, afternoons for a few days a week. And then that wasn't good enough. And so now it's Monday to Friday full time. Then it's evenings and now weekends coming as well. Uh, so it, it grows and grows, but we need to be able to keep up funding and resourcing rather than tax our nonprofits on that. Uh, systems don't talk to each other. So that is one area we hope to break down. And if there's an opportunity for action or investment that comes from this, uh, it would be having a system that would support um, uh, unification throughout uh, a region. So health authorities, nonprofits, um, ministry, uh, being able to connect and have systems that will share information about young people to stop the, uh, the people falling through the gaps when they go between services. Family supports are growing. Uh, thank you. Uh, family supports are growing. Um, uh, the need for family supports, we've, we see about uh, you know, 650 families per year reaching out for support um, and funneling of services. We get lots of people being referred in and very few places to uh, to send them. So we need that second round of family counseling, family support, respite, and uh, services like that. Um, and then we need to hold our partners accountable. Uh, we need to have the ministry show up um, when they say they will. We need to have 
uh, access for young people to services that are mandated in certain areas. And, and that's our goal, I believe, as, as foundries to hold those partners accountable to the young people. And, and then the big question, how do we re remain unique as Interior Health uh, just added, uh, I think, 18 new positions in our area for the opioid crisis. Um, how do we not become the ER? How do we not become uh, the ministry buildings uh, and still remain uh, unique and, and uh, something that's accessible to young people? Um, and just to, as we wrap up here, I really want to, I'm going to keep going, but I encourage any uh, questions to come through, Cameron, as well, if you have any questions uh, that you'd like to, to add. Um, this is, you know, just kind of finishing up here. Um, we have done a study for youth experience, and I'll talk about that in on the next slide. Um, measuring our success, you know, putting the time and effort into collecting data and measuring how are we doing um, and really hearing back from the youth, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, uh, you know, I think our youth are, when, when spoken to and really given an opportunity to speak freely, uh, they will tell us. Um, and then what, what is our role? What is our foothold? Uh, what's our niche in the healthcare system? Um, and can we stop being looked at as a separate part of the healthcare system as mental health, but in general be included in that overall healthcare system? Uh, adapting to ever needing uh, ever changing needs and then how do we how do we engage youth um, and looking at co-authoring and co-leading rather than uh, simply um, yeah, simply just asking questions or, or getting surveys from uh, in the way that we've been typically doing uh, and I would I'd be remiss if I didn't actually use a youth voice in this presentation because that would be very anti of what, uh, what I'm advocating for so uh, here's a, a cartoon uh, that was uh, drawn by one of our young research assistants, Michelle Bedell. Um, Dr. Shelley Ben David at UBCO um, has created a publication coming this month uh, that will be understanding mental health service and you know, accessing integrated youth services. Um, this is a great snapshot, and I'm happy to, to pass this on to anyone who would like it. Um, this is by youth, and uh, this is a youth voice in particular here. And um, there's a, a series of cartoons that have been developed of animated series uh, from this study from young people at our center. And uh, that's online and I've, I've put a link here and I'm happy to keep that as part of it or share it with whoever would like it. Um, and then this young person says, when I, first, when I first came here and I started talking about how I wanted to die, every time I was in here, I would come in feeling like that. And I would be feeling happy just because I wasn't told that's just how it goes, buck up. I came in here and I had uh, how I felt validated. Everyone was always so welcoming. Um, so, you know, I, I can't uh, finish this without hearing um, or, or speaking for youth who have uh, have given their voice to our project here and, and really contributed from everything from hiring practices. We have uh, young people who are part of our uh, interview process as well as families that are part of our interview process. So they truly, um, they form the foundation of our engagement and, uh, and how we move forward in decision-making. Um, I've got my email address there. I'm happy to discuss uh, or share information uh, on an individual level uh, and and talk more if anyone um, if anyone like that. I know I didn't leave a ton of time for questions. Um, I kind of powered through there to, to give some time. Uh, if anything has come up, I'm happy to share. Great. So thank you again for, for having me. Um, I think uh, it's really important that this, um, this is point of discussion in mental health. And uh, I think we have a long way to go. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we've got a good start here in Kelowna. And uh, I'm looking forward to learning a bit more from, from other presenters as well. Thank you very much, Ben. Thanks.